So this is a watershed moment. I remember having early discussions with Dr. Debbie Molina and Dr. Karen Solomon while we were doing the interactive perspective about how we can make this personal for doctors. And so we have this vision, and it's such an honor, and I'm so excited. Major teaching hospital to sponsor this. And so to echo what Karen said, this conversation is needed, and it's needed now. And we're so excited to have So I wear a few hats. Uh, I am an emergency medicine doctor at Massachusetts General Hospital and at Harvard Medical School. I have physicians at the Harvard Global Health Institute and at Harvard Sea Change, and I'm a contributor for the New England Journal. So today, I want to share a story. I remember vividly when I got my white coat in medical school. Felt a little bit like I was playing dress up. I may have had that many pens in my pocket. Always wanted to be prepared. But I can't remember the exact words of the Hippocratic Oath that we took, but I remember that I was committing to helping to relieve the suffering of my patients and preventing harm. Now flash forward to seven years ago when I learned about the climate crisis and how it was impacting health. And I was blown away because I had not heard of it up to that point in medical school or residency because I was then an attending physician. And I recognized that there was nothing else that I could dedicate my career to than working with this and so completely redirected my career. So call it perhaps a bit of a uh, oh, job hazard of spending all of my waking time outside of the hospital working on this issue. But I began seeing how it was clearly impacting the health of my patients here in Boston today. So I'm going to tell you three stories. The first is a four-year-old patient that I treated for yet her another asthma attack. It was her third for that week. And I just remember talking to her mother, and she was so helpless because she couldn't protect her daughter. So as we were waiting to admit her upstairs, her mom and I were able to have a conversation because it was a slower overnight, so I had a little bit more bandwidth, which was a blessing. But we talked about how pollen levels were higher because of rising CO2 levels, and she didn't know this connection. But we talked about ways that she could try to protect the health of her daughter. Flash forward from that patient to one that I treated this summer. And this was an elderly gentleman whose wife called 911 because he was acting confused. And he showed up in my emergency department with a chief complaint of fever. I know the EMTs well, having worked at MGH for almost seven years now. And so one of them came up and told me the backstory. And he said that they lived on the top floor of lower income housing. And they said that after climbing all of the stairs, they opened the door and were hit by a wave of heat that felt like the Sahara Desert. They had one window that was partially open and no air conditioning. So we quickly transferred the patient onto the stretcher and got a rectal temperature. And his core temperature was 106 degrees Fahrenheit. So that, with the confusion, made the diagnosis of heat stroke. And so we quickly moved him to our high acuity area and began to cool him. But he highlights the vulnerability that patients have, being elderly, and being lower income. The third patient was a patient from Boston Logan Airport, which you may be surprised to learn we actually get quite frequently. So came with her luggage. And she, as I talked to her more, I learned that she had gotten on a plane from Puerto Rico following Hurricane Maria. And she, I'll never forget it, she had a Ziploc bag that had all of her medication bottles in them, and all of them were empty. And there was still a tree branch that was still stuck in the bag. And she thrust it at me and asked for refills because she had been out of them for weeks. So we think about climate refugees happening in other places, but she was an internally displaced individual. As a result, climate intensified hurricane. So I've had this growing recognition that we need to add a climate lens to everything that I do in my clinical practice. And we also acknowledge that when we think about what
the broad impacts are of the climate crisis across the globe, there are other areas that are suffering far worse health impacts. But it's still impacting our patients, and we still have an obligation as a medical community to determine what we can do to improve our clinical practice and ensure that our care delivery is resilient so we can continue to treat our patients in their time of greatest need. So it's interesting, right? We often look at historical data to try to protect or predict the future. I will always look at a patient's prior urine cultures before prescribing antibiotics for a urinary tract infection to see what's worked in the past. But the climate crisis has created an unprecedented future that looks nothing like what we have experienced, either for our patients or for the environments that we've been, are currently practicing medicine in. And so we have to add that lens and understand where it is that we're heading, which includes understanding from a research standpoint what the agenda needs to be, because we can't prepare for what we don't understand. So what is this climate crisis? I still sometimes flabbergast me when I think about it's these invisible gases in the air that are wrecking such havoc. But carbon dioxide, which in the climate here, is been driving the rising greenhouse gas emissions caused by humans, causing all of these downstream effects. Largely, as you see here, kind of three big climate drivers. We talk about carbon dioxide because it's, but methane also plays a role. So it's causing rising temperatures, intensification of extreme weather, and rising sea levels. 2019 was the fifth consecutive year that the U.S. has had 10 or more billion dollar weather and climate disasters, and thus these are events that cause at least a billion dollars worth of damage. So what does this mean for our thermometer? So we are currently at one degree Celsius above pre-industrial time. The International Panel of Climate Change, or the IPCC, outlines that we have, if we want to try to keep the planet's temperature below 1.5, which is the fundamental goal of the Paris Agreement, that we have to half our carbon emissions by 2030 and reach net zero by 2050. That means that we are alive in a very profound point in history where what we do now is going to determine the future course. So as you can see, what is the difference, right? You at 1.5 is a half a degree from where we are now. And then what if we get to 2 degrees Celsius? Well, the IPCC released a report that outlines what a half a degree means. And 1.5 versus 2 means that at 2, there are no longer coral reefs that there will be a doubling of people around the globe who experience extreme heat waves. And another 60 million will be thrown into water scarcity. So here's a map from a wonderful review uh, by Andy Haynes and Chris Ebai that outline what 1.5 means. And I think a theme of the climate crisis is that it is not an equal opportunity impactor. And so as you can see, there's going to be regional variation of how temperature is going to change as a result of a 1.5 degree warmer world. Now, dark red colors means higher temperature. So you'll see some of them are seven to nine degrees higher. January, just last month, was the warmest January ever recorded. Boston broke records. I'm sure a lot of you hopefully enjoyed the 70 plus degree days we had. It was always sort of a little bittersweet, right? And it actually had a record-breaking 65 degrees last week on February 6th, which put them at the same temperature as San Diego. And what about us sitting here? Well, I often describe us as the proverbial canary in the coal mine, because the Northeast is actually warming faster than anywhere else in the contiguous U.S. We are going to reach 2 degrees Celsius 20 years before the rest of the U.S. Our oceans are warming three times faster off of our coast, which has significant implications, thinking about the growth of, in conditions that are favorable for bacteria like Vibrio. 
And our sea levels are rising at some of the highest rates. And there are predictions that we could reach 11 feet by the end of the century. So before we get too alarmed by these statistics, it also means that we have a profound opportunity and I think responsibility to start having these conversations like the one we're having today. Because we are the ones that are experiencing this first and need to work collectively with the rest of the country to figure out solutions. So there is an analogy that really resonates with me and that's what, when I have a patient that's crashing in front of me, I give them every treatment that might save their life. So as I've painted, we are in that critical moment. And so we need to hit all of these potential ways to address the climate crisis. We have to tackle mitigation, which is prevention, the ultimate prevention of getting to the root cause. And climate action is health action. We have to help our public health colleagues adapt and protect the populations. And with all hands on deck, we also have to see if we can put some of this carbon back in the ground. But the conversation that we are having here today is a little had one, and that's how is that affecting our day-to-day -day in clinical practice? And how is that affecting our hospitals and our ability to deliver care? So the climate crisis is broad and has a lot of implications. And you will hear more from some of our wonderful specialists who will dive into some of these areas in more detail. But I want to hit some of the highlights. And the first is heat stress. As we already know, it has implications for cardiovascular and cerebrovascular outcomes. It also has implications for uh, mental health, so making existing mental health conditions worse, increasing aggression and violence. Also has been associated with kidney stones. And it's associated also with harmful obstetric outcomes, such as preterm um, spontaneous abortion and preterm delivery. The next one you'll see up there is air quality. You will hear much more detail about that. But it is not only worsening ground level ozone, our colleagues who are in exposure to wildfire smoke, and think about pollen, as I already mentioned. But a critical one that we can't forget is the fact that the very fossil fuel combustion that is driving the climate crisis is also producing particulate matter, which we know has widespread impacts. So action to address our fossil fuels will get at both of those health harms. The next one you'll see is food. So it's impacting our nutrition. Certain crops have less micronutrients and protein, and it's really impairing our ability to deliver food and our existing system by making climate sensitive foodborne diseases um, worse and also imp having issues with our distribution chains. Water, critical issue. And so actually of the eight pathogens that cause 97% of waterborne diseases, they're all climate sensitive. In addition to extreme weather. So there was a recent paper that came out that actually showed the disruption in lung cancer patients who are receiving radiation treatments resulted in earlier mortality. And to quote Ari, he said, if we can tie this to cancer, we can tie this to anything. So, but extreme weather has other profound right, issues in regards to disrupting healthcare systems and making it harder to manage chronic diseases. The other one with vector-borne illness we'll hear in more detail. And the last one is around social factors. So again, as I mentioned with my patient who is internally displaced, I can't think of a population that has more health risks, health risks than one who is displaced. So some of these exposure pathways are gonna vary based off where you live, right? We don't have wildfire smoke plumes that we have to encounter on a daily basis like some of our other colleagues in other parts of the US. But even the universal climate exposures vary by geography. So I want to talk through this, this figure a little bit. So the red bars are the peak hospital admissions for heat-related illness. And you'll see the first column is all cause, and then it breaks it down by the respective categories. So you can see that at about 86 degrees Fahrenheit, we experience the rise of and peak of heat-related hospitalizations. 
The gray bar that you'll see is when the heat alert went out. So as you can see, the heat alerts are going out at much warmer temperatures than what people are suffering harm. But how does that compare for regions? So you can see that there's about a 20 degree difference for that versus the south. And then how does that compare with the west? You'll see that they're actually are experiencing health harms at even five degree cooler temperatures. So I think what this shows is that one, the power of research and data because pe people are making changes to heat alerts as a result of this research. Two, that humans can adapt. And three, that we need to learn from each other because we're all experiencing this in different ways and have different experiences to share. So I recognize the irony in this, but I often describe our current understanding of the health harms as an iceberg. So we see what's just above the surface, but what brings me the most apprehension is the largest mass that exists underneath. For example, just in the past year, rising temperatures have been linked to bacterial resistance to antibiotics and congenital heart disease. So I think this really stresses that we need to add a climate lens to our existing research infrastructure and also ensure that we set out an agenda for people to focus on these issues. Because again, we can't prepare for what we don't know. So all of this led to a perspective, which was released today, where I took the, my perspective as an emergency medicine doctor with a heat stress lens here in the Northeast with my local practice environment at MGH and thought through what are some improvements and changes that we can make to our clinical practice now that will add a climate lens and improve the way that we deliver care. So here's sort of a broader framework that I'd like to present and think through. Because we know that when we're practicing and sitting in our exam room with our patients, that we sit at a nexus of multiple different influences. So it's critically important to think about the public health interventions we can do, because nothing is better than preventing disease to begin with and preventing patients from even having to come into our door to see us. Looking at the how it's impacting healthcare delivery and disruptions there. That's where I want to move next. Anyone from Florida? So, a few hands. So Hurricane Michael pummeled, pummeled Florida in October of 2018. And the New York Times did a really profound piece where they describe what was happening to hospitals and healthcare workers. And they describe images of people bleeding and having obvious medical needs, standing in front of hospitals that were closed. They also highlight this tweet that one of the hospitals sent out to try to reach the police to make sure that they brought in and allowed the supply check to come through so they could continue to care for their patients. So we can have all the knowledge in the world, but if we don't have a standing infrastructure with supplies we need, we can't give patients the care that they need. Anyone work at Mount Auburn? So Mount Auburn had a double cable failure in July of last year. And they experienced seven hours of power loss. We have backup generators, which is critical. But backup generators typically only supply power to certain aspects of hospital function. And they don't often include cooling. It was 90 degrees Fahrenheit this day. And you can see this quote that's included in this piece that outlines that it became too hot in the upper floors of the hospital for it to be safe for patients, so they had to move them down. Even once power was restored, this next quote shows that some of the critical equipment was too hot to be able to function, and so they had to allow it to cool down before they could fully regain their ability to provide care. You can say this is an isolated incident. Well, this is the 2018 National Climate Assessment, and they outline that just extreme heat itself is predicting to have more frequent power outages and disruptions. And other extreme weather obviously has its own implications for power, and sometimes in surprising ways. So our colleagues out in California, they had 
intentional power outages to prevent wildfires. And about 250 hospitals lost power as a result. Hurricane Maria, when it hit Puerto Rico, also hit a factory that produced about half of intravenous saline. There have been some intermittent shortages, but this really caused profound shortages. And it impacted me. We had MGH. So patients come in with gastroenteritis, vomiting, diarrhea. They expect to get an IV, get IV fluids. You can imagine their surprise when I hand them a Gatorade. Allowed opportunity for conversation. But again, it gets back to the point that if we don't have supplies, then we can't provide the care we need. So thinking through improvements, I mean, from infrastructure, Boston and some of the organizations here have really been leaders in thinking through how we can make our infrastructure resilient. But there's more work that needs to be done. Do we need to be training clinicians and staff on what to do during a power outage? And when we think about supply chain vulnerabilities, how can we understand in advance what our future vulnerabilities will be and start preparing? So with that, I'm going to dive into the middle bucket. And I think where, again, the heart of this conversation in our day-to-day -day clinical practice. So emergency medical technicians and EMTs are our extension of the emergency departments in our community. And there's this evolving understanding of community paramedicine, that how can we use these individuals that are out in the community to help give education on heat-related illness. My patient's wife that I described was left in those very same conditions that nearly killed her husband. Then you move to a patient that comes into our door. So I think about my triage protocols. We have protocols for sepsis, but this patient was incorrectly labeled as fever. So how can we notify clinicians that the temperature is sufficient that for people who have the right exposure to heat could have heat stroke if they have fever? Should we be getting rectal temperatures at triage and thus expediting the treatment? The next one is patient screening. So you can imagine screening for air conditioning and others that some of my colleagues will get into. But should we be screening for displaced individuals like my patient from Puerto Rico? and have a pathway in place to get them integrated into our health system. What about diagnosis? It's making it harder for me to diagnose. I got trained in the Midwest. Lyme disease, obviously not something that I had enormous experience with, but you can imagine that every rash or other symptoms in my emergency department could be Lyme. And we need to think about this as diseases move to other places, and it's making it harder for clinicians to make diagnosis. For soft tissue infections, I need to think about ocean water exposure and think about Vibria. And then think about our treatment. So I prescribe patients medications that I expect to work. But there's evidence to show that when temperatures are reach a certain threshold that can occur in a car in extreme weather, that albuterol inhalers and EpiPens may not be as effective. So how do we educate our patients about how to use those safely? Patient education and discharge. I rely heavily on my primary care clinician colleagues, but when I see a patient in the emergency department in the middle of a heat wave, I recognize that I also serve a critical role, and we often serve as a safety net to the healthcare system. So sure, I can tell my patient to follow up with their primary care doctor, but then I've missed that critical window. So should I be educating them on if they're on certain medications or at higher risk for heat-related injury? One study showed that a patient who's on an ACE inhibitor and a diuretic has a three-time higher risk of heat-related illness. Thinking about do they have a backup plan if they lose power, especially if they have equipment that requires power like a nebulizer machine. So I bring all of this up because these are just, I'm thinking out loud to you, and we need to think out loud together so we can really think about what these improvements might be and learn from each other. So there's a broad spectrum of ways that we as clinicians and healthcare providers can engage on the climate crisis. And we're gonna give nods to all of those because they're critically important. But again, we're really focusing on what we can do here for clinical practice improvements. 
when a patient is saved in my emergency department, we realize this is the reason we went into emergency medicine, adrenaline junkie. That patient is never saved by one person. There is always a team from the health, environmental services who cleaned the room that allowed us to go in to care for that patient, to the nurse, to the pharmacist, to the technician, to the resident, it, to the doctor. It takes a team effort. And I think there's so much right now in our culture and in our society that is dividing us that what brings me the most hope and inspiration is bringing teams together, breaking down silos, and recognizing that unprecedented challenges mandate unprecedented solutions. So that's why we're very excited to launch the initiative around the climate crisis in clinical practice to begin having that critical joint conversation. And we hope that it will only continue to grow from here. So we have six sites within the US and one internationally. University of Washington, Stanford, University of Wisconsin, University of Colorado, Cleveland Clinic, and Emory. And there are people here from Emory, Stanford, and Cleveland Clinic. Could you please stand? Woo! <laughs> Thank you. Sorry to call you out, but I think it's really important. We got half of our sites here. And this is just the beginning. We look forward to working with you and others in this room, right, to continue this conversation. In order to really foster this conversation, we're also having an online forum to share best practices. So the Resident 360 website is opening a discussion, which is actually opened at 1, so you can all log on now. Don't do it now. Pay attention. But please register and pose questions. The goal of this is to have a discourse. We don't all have the answers individually, but collectively we do. You may also notice when you registered that there were pins that are buttons that are available. And the goal of this is just to really amplify the recognition. So if you feel inclined, wear it in your practice room, your exam room, and with your patients. Hopefully it fosters conversation with your colleagues and with your patients and others. So with that, I am so excited for the conversation that will follow as we all continue to learn from one another at this really profound moment in time to be able to start a conversation around how we can improve our clinical practice today to improve the health of our patients and make our healthcare systems more resilient. So with that, I turn it over to my friend and colleague, Ari Bernstein. Thank you. <laughs>